Hello and welcome again to Vote Chat. Vote Chat is uh, brought to you by the uh, University of Otago's Politics Department. Uh, my name's Peter Grace. It's a snow day in Dunedin, and that means, as I understand it, being an Aucklander and new to this town, that you don't have to get out of bed. Uh, as a result, we have a rather thin audience here, but I'm sure there's lots of you lying in bed watching us uh, as we live stream. And as always, uh, we are available on Twitter for your questions. So here's Sam to explain to you how it's done. Thanks, Peter. Today, as usual, we will be accepting questions for our guest via social media. Today, we're joined by Shane Gallagher of the Greens. Shane is the Green Party candidate for the Dunedin South electorate. If you have any questions for Shane or the Greens, you can tweet them to us via our Twitter handle, at OUVoteChat. Alternatively, you can use the hashtag VoteChat14. But for now, back to Peter. Thank you, Sam. Uh, as Sam said, we're very lucky to have uh, Shane Gallagher in the audience, uh, joining us today, I should say. Um, uh, Shane is uh, the uh, uh, candidate for the Green Party for uh, South Dunedin. And uh, he's uh, very kindly stepped in uh, at a moment's notice to replace Asinati Lola Taylor, who couldn't be with us. Possibly she knew it was going to snow today. Uh, thanks for joining us, Shane. Thank you for having me on the show. Uh, last night we had some uh, interesting um, sensational news uh, that followed up on our conversation with Lila Harry last week. Last week we talked to Lila about uh, uh, participatory um, voting uh, and uh, getting uh, the youth involved. Uh, and uh, then it was all over the news last night, uh, this famous chant that went on at an internet party function. Uh, which uh, I'm not allowed to repeat, uh, well at least I won't, I probably am allowed to repeat but I won't do it for the sake of the marketing comms department, uh, where um, uh, Mr Key, the Prime Minister, was um, basically told where to go. Uh, now I'm really interested uh, in your feedback on this. Uh, do you think that it was a, uh, an angry, uh, righteously uh, angry crowd that was uh, uh, doing the chanting, or do you think it was a bunch of dumb kids that were basically um, having some fun? Well, no, you can't call them dumb kids, and I think that's really kind of patronising. And I think the reaction to this has been also uh, nearly hysterical. Um, I sure as um, chanted much worse when, I was, uh, when we were students, uh, protesting against uh, Thatcher and Reagan and, and in the nuclear, you know, nuclear war weapons is issues when we were younger. And, you know, young people just chant things. It was, it was very obvious it was spontaneous in the crowd. It was just happened for a couple of seconds. And uh, the idea that somehow, I mean, and the comparisons I've been made have just been absolutely crazy, you know, comparing them to Nazi Germany is, I mean, historically nonsense. And... Uh, I just think this is kind of just a little bit of a beat up, and um, I just think it's just, an, I think it's just nonsensical. Just you know. Well, Russell Brown made the comment I think in, uh, yesterday that uh, he felt uh, the same as you, um, that it was uh, um, that that that, that uh, anger is is uh, quite appropriate for the occasion, uh, and he also said that the chant was not new, that it was not something that was created on the spur of the moment, but in fact has been going on uh, with a particular New Zealand hip hop group for some time. So um, perhaps it wasn't quite as sensational as, as it was made up. No, I think uh, the thing what's happening is that these things have been used as opportunities to attack Internet Man at Parity. And, um, you know, this, I mean, these are sideshows. This is a way of distracting people from actually addressing the real issues that face New Zealand. And, you know, we're not interested in, uh, as a party or as an organisation, in engaging that kind of, um, engaging these sideshows. We're just not interested in this. We really want to focus on the issues that are facing New Zealand. And, a small, you know, a three-second chant at a, at, a, at a rap party is not, it's nothing. You, know, it's, it's you came to, uh, to New Zealand in 2002 mm -hmm. uh, from Ireland? Indeed, yeah. I came via Scotland. From Scotland. So, um, yeah, it's How does Ireland. it compare with English or Irish or Scottish politics? Do you, do you find New Zealand is a, a much more, um, a much quieter, uh, we, yeah, uh, we engage it's, more? Or? Yeah, it's much more open. I, the politics here is much o more open. Uh, it's, it's a funny combination of uh, being quite far advanced in its socially, for instance, much socially progressive. Uh, also kind of slightly naive as well, there's a certain naivety, 
compared to the old politics of Europe, which is, you know, very, very, you know, we're talking about a political history of hundreds, maybe a thousands of years old. And um, I would never have got involved in politics in Ireland because, you know, quite frankly, or in the UK, because the, the environment is really, really toxic. And it's not, you know, to, to go into that environment is, you really are putting your life out there and involving yourself in very nasty, in, a uh, very nasty place, and uh, I never would have considered doing it. But here, I think it's much more open, it's much on, more honest. There's, there's, there are lines around which, you know, your family is never included. There are these unwritten rules which kind of insulate you from, you know, being personally attacked and really focusing around uh, the politics. So it, I think it's a much more pleasant place to engage in politics in New Zealand. And it's exciting as well. So was it the Green Party you were attracted to, or were you already a, a member of the Greens in England? I wasn't. Um, well, I was always an environmentalist. I, I started off with the Youth Forest, European Youth Forest Action back in, when I was 17 or something back in Dublin. And uh, we went to various European uh, EU training camps, and I had a lot of very, very positive experiences. Uh, we were focusing on forests then at that point because through the lens of forests, we could address all the other environmental issues, water, you know, water uh, cleanliness. So uh, streams being polluted, well, we could tie that back to forestry and you know, clearing, clearing forests on, on hillsides and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, they would then uh, affect watersheds and affect water quality. So that was the kind of thing that we were, we were involved in. And we got a lot of support from the European Commission and the European Union, a lot of funding to do the activities that we did. And they really trained us and enabled us to be active and participate within, within the political sphere as, as an NGO. And I then got involved in the trade union movement when I started working. And when I came over here, I was involved with the uh, trade union at the university. I became president for a couple of years. And it was through my uh, friends, at, uh, especially Sean Scott at, at uh, the Tertiary Education Union, who really got me onto the Greens, because he was a member. And he said, Shane, this is really the party for you. You should go and join. And I joined, and everything went from there. I joined in 2008, and was, um, wound up being the candidate for Dunedin South in 2008, same year. So. so can you explain to me how it works? Because you're standing in South Dunedin, which is Claire Curran's um, mm -hmm. electorate at the moment. She's the, can uh, the sitting MP. Uh, is there a concern that you'll split the vote uh, and that you might unseat Claire Curran uh, and allow um, Hamish, Hamish, Hamish Walker, Hamish Walker, yeah. Hamish Walker into, the, into the seat instead? Is there a fear of that? Uh, no. Um, you know, Claire has to win the seat by herself. You know, mm -hmm. that's not our job. Our job's for the party vote. Mm -hmm. You can't tell people how to vote. We're only asking for the party vote unless, in fact, well, every single meeting I'll be going to, I'll be asking only for the party vote, because a, a vote for me is really a wasted vote. Um, so people need to vote for the person they believe will best represent them in the electorate. And the party vote is really the, the, where the strength lies, so that really determines the, the makeup of parliament. And so people really need to consider exact, you know, uh, how to vote, and that party voting is really, really the key thing. And the electorate votes really for the person who best represents you and your electorate. So, so are you looking for the, the party vote? Only the party vote, yes. Only the party vote. And, uh, and Dunedin's a university town, and traditionally uh, a large number of your voters would come from university students. Mm -hmm. Um, but I imagine as a residential university, a large number of them are also enrolled back in their hometowns. Yes. So does that mean that, that you have to go looking elsewhere for, for voters? Uh, no, we always have a, a wide range of voters. I mean, we have uh, our appeal goes every, every, every generation and every age group has, we have an appeal for. And although students are strongly vote green, um, we're trying to encourage voters, uh, student voters to enrol in Dunedin so they can cast a vote here. Because there is a danger that on voting day that they can go to the polling station and then realise that they can't vote because they're not right. enrolled in the, in the right electorate. So I would appeal to students to uh, ensure that they're enrolled in the right, in the right constituency, in the right electorate. Uh, so on voting day, they're, they're, their voice is heard. And that's really the important thing. Um, so our, our appeal is, to everyone, you know, every age group 
we have policies for everyone. And, uh, so you're doing a lot of door knocking at the moment? We are indeed, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we can out there, and this is, a, 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 again, a new strategy for us, because before we, we would uh, you know, leaflet drop, and, and uh, so we were kind of, we didn't have as much capacity as we do now, because we're a much larger priority. And the feedback that we've been getting is that they don't really know, they know what we stand for, but we don't know who we are. So the strategy now is to go out door knocking so that people meet us and know us as individuals and as, as, a, as a group and get to know us as people. And that's really where, where our next stage is at. So we're getting out there, meeting the people or the electorate and uh, the voters and so they can make those personal connections with us, not just with our values. Um, grassroots, it's a, an interesting word. Um, there's been a tendency perhaps over the last 30 years for the grassroots and for some other parties perhaps to be um, ignored or, or even just, mm -hmm. just not involved. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, and that's often mooted as one of the reasons why people have become less engaged with politics. Mm -hmm. uh, their voice isn't being heard. Um, the, the internet party's got a, an incubator that they have mm -hmm. online for ideas. But I understand that the Green Party has, has had that for some time. We've always had it since the very beginning. Right. So when the party was set up, it was uh, the people who set that up, the party up, really learnt a lot of lessons from the other political parties that they'd been a part of. And they understood that if you wanted to be a truly democratic organisation, you actually had to walk the walk. You, know, you have to walk the talk. You have to be democratic within your own organisation. Otherwise, you what you do is when you get into power or you get into parliament, you then simply reflect the power structure of, of your own party. So if you have a very top-down um, structure where they've the very top uh, number of people in the party dictate practically everything that happens in it, then you take that mode of being, that mode of action, into your, uh, the way that you rule, rule a country or the way you operate in the world. So it becomes much more a part of, about the, the party actually being in power yeah. than about the issues of the party or the ideology of the party. Yeah, exactly. And for us, we, what we want to do is, is to walk the talk and be absolutely democratic. So your membership, our membership is, absolute, you know, is, is very, very powerful. Uh, they decide everything. They develop the policy. They elect you know, the candidates directly. So our candidate list is directly voted on by the membership. And uh, everyone, you know, our co-leaders and our co-conveners, our co-conveners are like the presidents of the party, are merely a phone call away uh, from any member. And, uh, we have, and everyone's equal. Everyone has an equal voice. Everyone has an equal level of say. And uh, so it's a very, very flat structure. And it means things are a little bit slower than in other parties, you know, but... That democracy, you know, as Winston Churchill said, democracy is absolutely the worst possible system except for everything else. So, you know, it is slightly more slow and a bit more cumbersome, and that can sometimes, you know, create a few tensions because you want to get stuff done quickly. But the process is really, really important, you know, and so you don't get schisms. We have a consensus decision making. So that means that. Uh, everyone has to come to an agreement. And that can be a very, very slow and drawn out process, but it means at the end of the day, the entire party is brought uh, along with every single decision that's made. One of the things we were talking about before we came on was uh, that the party's been very consistent in terms of what it stands for, what the issues that you see are important. So uh, you don't have to spend a whole lot of time uh, saying this is, this is our identity, this is what we're, what we're here for. A party that perhaps changes its policies regularly mm -hmm. or has no ideology to speak of at all has to sort of start from scratch again and, and explain to people what we're going to push this election. You don't have to do that. No, no, because we have a core set of values. And so those core values are well understood, I think, in the electorates and in the, with, in the voting public. And we understand very clearly what we stand for. So when we're trying to engage with the public, uh, we are really offering solutions. So 
we're kind of very, very solutions focused. So we're trying to offer solutions. And if people have seen our billboards, uh, our election campaign has been about opening up a conversation with New Zealand about uh, the problems. So our hashtag is, you know, love New Zealand, and then it's contrasted with uh, one, in f you know, one in the four children who doesn't have a lunch or a no shoes in their feet because poverty is a huge issue. We have 250,000 children living in poverty who aren't, who don't have food, you know, at lunchtime. I mean, I, um, one of the children that my uh, son was best friends with at school, um, he didn't have lunch. And I found out about it because Connor, my son, would tell me that he gave, you know, um, his friend, I won't name him, um, some food. And I then, when I realised this was happening, I always pack extra stuff and say, look, you know, share that. And made sure that he had lunch. But, you know, this is real. Uh, some people, I think, don't quite understand that it is real, that somehow, the, because they have no connection with it or don't have a connection with people or children who ha don't have are experiencing these things, that somehow it's not real. It is real. There are 250,000 children in poverty. Well, I heard an example of that, an illustration of that, which I thought was mind-boggling, of a, a girl in Wellington uh, who was about five or six, who was um, sent to uh, a specialist um, about uh, stealing. The school had uh, caught her stealing and, and, uh, and wanted to you know, arrest this problem. The, the, what they found was that she was stealing apples off kids who didn't want to eat them. They were left over at the end of the lunch and she was getting into their bags and taking the apples. And this girl was actually in the house where she had to cook her all her own meals and the food that was provided for her was toast. You know, just shocking stuff. I mean, this is heartbreaking. Mm. I mean, you... Uh, it's a disgrace that a country as wealthy and as abundant in food as New Zealand is, that there are children going hungry that have... Can you imagine what it's like as a child that young to have to steal food or take food from other children? I mean, what does that say to you? How can any government look itself in the mirror? Can any minister, any person in government look themselves in the mirror and actually stand out in public and say, this is all all right. That you don't have to address this urgently. And the solutions are simple, and we just have to have compassion and empathy. And, and reach out. I mean, imagine your, ch your own child or, or a child that you know in this situation. What would you do? You instantly give them food. The solutions are there. We absolutely just have to, as a nation, face up to this fact and address the problem. It's a massive structural problem. This is a real structural problem. But there are solutions on the table. We can simply feed these children. There is no problem. And I don't understand the mentality that allows people to, for these children to suffer because they think their parents or grandparents or whatever their families are somehow morally deficient because they're poor. You know, this is, this is not right. This is... The inequality is thing is, is something that you're um, very interested in. Absolutely. Um, the, the widening gap between uh, rich and poor. And, and, uh, and the polls have been showing that inequality is becoming more of an issue for New Zealanders. I think if you look four or five months ago, it probably didn't figure very largely on people's wish lists. But people do want to do something about it now. Well, I think now that people are really beginning to understand that this is a massive problem. And it is. It, and the thing is, the strange thing is that um, inequality affects everyone, even the very, very, even the very least, the 0.01%, the very top, suffer from inequality. And the more equal your society is, the better everyone is. And there are structural economic um, practices and policies put in place to create inequality. And we can see, if you, look, if you look at the map of inequality, you can see like in the early 80s when Rogernomics was implemented, that inequality suddenly shot up and just got higher and higher and higher and started to kind of reduce a wee bit in the, in the late 2000s, but now it's, it's increased again. And it's, and any, and it was interesting enough because I, in the last election 2011, in 2011, 
we were talking about inequality and uh, the point was made by uh, among the National Party candidates that you know, inequality had reduced, the Gini coefficient had reduced. And somehow he, he was trying to imply that poverty had been reduced. And it wasn't that poverty had been in, reduced. It had been people's, the value of the very richest people's share, the share values have dropped a wee bit. So their actual nominal value, their nominal wealth had decreased slightly because their share values had just dropped. And it was so disingenuous because he, they were trying to portray this as being a reduction in the levels of poverty in this country, and it wasn't at all. There's very much a willingness, as far as the, the rich and wealthy are concerned, to get the, the focus away from that, mm. that gap and to look back at poverty. And, and, and there's almost a, um, uh, a conflict in terms of the way that the, in, the word inequality is used. Mm. It's, uh, as Max Rashbrook, who was with us at the very beginning of the series, uh, has said, uh, perhaps it's more about balancing and sharing than it is about inequality. Perhaps the way to actually make people's hearts you know, mm. open up is to talk about old New Zealand values, like are we sharing well or are we, you know, are we balancing this? Right? Yeah, because I mean, the, the, the framing, the, the language around uh, inequality is really, really interesting because if we start talking about sharing and community, and this is what really what we're trying to do, is talking about communities, talking about sharing, talking about New Zealand as a whole, we're all one big, you know, we're all one big family, we're all intimately interconnected with each other. I think if we start talking about those kind of things, and, and I mean, remind people that New Zealand used to be the, have the highest standard of living in the entire planet. And it used, and a lot of people are kind of surprised by that, so, you know, because we used to be one of the most equal countries, have the highest standard of living, have, it, it was, we did have this utopia as, as much as it was then. It was very much part of our ethos, wasn't yeah, it, as it a was. country, that we believed in, the, in, in equality. And everyone had fair, you know, the, the idea of a fair go. Well, you can't have a fair go if you're, you know, if you're born in poverty. If you're, uh, when you're a baby, you, you, you get rheumatic fever uh, because your house is so poorly insulated and damp and you're living in such appalling conditions that uh, from the very beginning, you are uh, on the back foot. That's not a fair go. And you compare that to somebody who has come from the wealthy family, who has every, um, every advantage of life, has good health, and you know, they're, not, they're not starting at the same spot. So how can they, you know, so they have, you know, the person who's born, born into poverty has to do so much extra hard work just to get to the same level as somebody else's, you know, a wealthy person starting off with. And this produces massive, chasms in your own society. So there's, there's people who never meet, you know, there's groups of people in, in New Zealand who never meet. Um, the, the, you know, the middle class may never, you know, er, sub parts of the middle class may never meet very, very poor people. We definitely have divisions of yeah. neighbourhoods where you don't cross. Absolutely, we don't need cross, to cross lines. Yeah, and I remember seeing that in America, and coming from Ireland, which was, was a very, you know, again, it comes from a very similar egalitarian kind of uh, principle and idea that everyone's very equal. Um, going to the US and, and discovering that there was these neighborhoods and there was these invisible lines in the road yes. and people just never crossed them. Yes. And both, and it was, it was astounding to me, but I think it happens here as well. And it, and I, like I say, because people don't see it, they don't realize it's a problem. And I think we need to start making those connections. People need to reconnect again and gain empathy. So if, if you hear the language of division and you know, blame from a politician, you always have to question what are the motives. So what you want to hear are the words of empathy, kindness, compassion, community, togetherness, and love. Because really it's about love. At the end of the day, every single religion on this planet says that love is the core principle of everything that we should do and the way that we should be in the world is love and compassion. Okay, I think we'll come back to that yeah. because um, we do have a question from the Twitter desk and here's Sam. We've received a question via email. How can you improve the quality of education in New Zealand? Okay, that's really interesting because um, we don't do it by having national standards <laughs> because I'll give you a story. My, my, my son, um, uh, has um, ADD and dyslexia, uh, but he is also uh, a genius. He's in the 99 percentile of um, reasoning 
you know, problem solving. And I remember sitting behind him when he was doing the test for it, and he was getting faster and faster, and towards the end when he was doing the really difficult problems, he was solving them quicker than I was, and I was at, he was at 13. And I was just blown away by this. That, but at school, he can't write and he can't spell. And although he had a reading age of 17, we only realized that he had dyslexia because he was using very complicated, uh, non-standard problem-solving techniques in order to figure out what the words were. And interestingly enough, I've, we've, I have a friend here at the university who's a Fulbright scholar from the United States. And she has exactly the same spectrum of uh, learning dis disabilities that he has. But she's a Fulbright scholar from the United States who's done extremely well for herself. Now, Con my son is not doing so well at school. And that's because the school system's failing him, not because my, my he's daughter, failing yes. My daughter was dyslexic. It took two years for them to identify it. And in that two years, she almost totally lost her self-esteem. Absolutely. And, and so the, the battle then wasn't to get her to read books, but to get his confidence back. Yeah, and my son's facing the same thing now. He's really lost self-confidence. He doesn't want to do any work because he feels his teachers don't expect him to do well. So, and so you apply standard, that to the whole system? Yeah, yeah, you apply that to the whole system. So the national standards turned around and told my son that he was a failure. Okay, my son's not a failure. Right? The system has every person in the planet has a different route to fulfilling their, their, abil their ability as a, as a human being and become flourish as a human being. So our education system has to reflect that. Now we do have one of the best education systems on, in the world. And dollar for dollar we have the best. And what the National Party are doing are copying the, the failed systems of the US and the UK instead of like looking to, well, who's got the better education system? It's Finland. Finland has a better education system. They don't do tests and they don't have homework. So why don't we look and see, well, who's doing better than us and are there things that we can improve? We have a very good education system. We have amazing teachers here. And the reason why my son and probably your daughter weren't, weren't picked up because we didn't have the support services in the education system. Uh, you know, the clinical, uh, the educational psychologist and the other support uh, partners in the education system to pick those children up find out that there's an issue here and support them. So that's really what one of the things we need to do. We have, a, you know, the Green Party has a lot of uh, policies. We have 21 and one of tw free 20 hours ECE for two-year-olds. We want to have, uh, you know, get rid of bulk funding for, um, uh, for teacher support. So we want, we want to put in a lot of support around the education system. But we want to part, what you do, you don't go in and tell teachers how to do their job. You partner with the education uh, professionals. You treat them as professionals. You understand that they're professionals. And there are the people on the ground doing the job day to day. They're the experts. So you go in to the experts, um, to your teachers, and say, how do we partner with you to make this system better? And you, you bring the whole community in. How do we make the education system better? How do we become the best education system in the world? How do we overtake Finland? And that's how we do it. And we just, you do it. So you're talking about a much more inclusive approach, which Absolutely. is. Absolutely. Yeah. This is what we talk, again, this is going back to that grassroots idea. You don't tell people how to do their jobs. You don't impose solutions from the top because they fail. You know, this is the, one of the biggest, you know, there's a, a chap called Scott, um, wrote a book, seen, uh, seen as a State, and explaining why states fail when they try to imp imp improve things around the country. So they come up with a solution that may work in one particular area, and then you try to impose it everywhere. And it fails because they're not taking into account the, uh, the local knowledge, people's local abilities, and the unique um, circumstances in each area, and they're not partnering with that and making come up with creative, innovative solutions. And that's really what we should be doing. Uh, so this is, this is why yeah, grassroots, I, I, when you're being... I'm, I'm really being interested in, in, in something that crept into the, into the language a couple of years ago. When you ask a politician a question on television, yeah. uh, you see it almost every night. Um, the, the, the first thing they answer with is they say, look, you know, 
that whole, it's, it, it, you, you accused me of being patronising before. And I, I no, 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 <laughs> you were patronising. But that is so patronising, yeah. that thing which says, you know, look, it's like, look, I haven't got time to answer this question, or look, this is a, you, you know, you're just being dumb by asking me this question, yeah, yeah, or look, yeah. you know, uh, it's not even worth talking about, yeah. you know? And I th you know, we're talking about inclusion, we're talking about getting people involved. Uh, in a way, there's a shutdown process going mm -hmm. on. Uh, where, where politicians are saying, we don't want to talk about the issues. You know, no. they'll be, let's talk about it, let's talk about it and get it over and done with and get there so we can move on. Do you, th do you think that's true? Absolutely, absolutely true. And so the idea is that you have, you know, and the media, I mean, this is fantastic that we actually have a, a long conversation here. We actually talk about something in, in depth because the, the media kind of are complicit in this because of the sound bite, you know, you have a two second conversation or a one minute conversation with the politician. So they have to kind of get this, a single message across really, really quickly. And so you can't actually discuss anything in depth. You can't explain anything complicated. So what you do is you shut down the conversation and you give, and you give a sound bite and that's it. There's no, there's no conversation. There's no space for a conversation. And you don't talk about issues because issues are complicated. What happens when you do have a complicated issue like climate change, okay? So the Greens own climate change to a certain extent, right? Yeah. Uh, everybody knows that that's something that's right at the top of your agenda. Uh, there must be an enormous sense of frustration that you cannot get out there and talk about it, and talk about it in depth. Yes, because, and there's a couple of problems there, because climate change, when you're talking about negative things, like look, climate change is a big, big negative, it's like, you know, it's the greatest existential threat that mankind's ever faced. And we have to, you know, I think, whereas people kind of intellectually know it, they kind of don't know it in here. Yep. And it's difficult to have that conversation with people honestly, without actually having some sort of in-depth and lengthy discussion. So, you know, you can say that it's nonsense or, and people dismiss you because they don't want to actually have to address issues. So you need to have conversations, you need to have space for conversations. And I think that's what's lacking in But a lot democracy. of the stuff with climate change is scientific. Yes. It's not, it's not really a warm fuzzies, it's getting into technical stuff. Yeah. You know? and, and a lot of people don't understand tipping points and, and abrupt world climate change. And also the language of science as well. The language of science doesn't really lend itself to the vernacular. So. Um, so when people say theory, when the scientist says theory, what they're saying is this is the established facts as far as we can yep. tell. When uh, a lay person hears theory, they think, oh, this is kind of something we think might be happening. Yep. So there's, there's a breakdown in the, in the scientific language and, uh, and the vernacular language. So th there's a barrier there that we, we haven't been really uh, breaching. And the media should really be doing that. Uh, you know, they should be, and, and, and this is the other problem is that without, uh, journalists and, and who have in-depth knowledge and can maybe translate that language a wee bit uh, for uh, the lay person to make them, you know, to let them have this understanding and maybe have that conversation happen. This, that's not happening because of the way the media has been structured. Uh, you know, there's this, you know, there's money, you know, because of the rise of the internet, uh, you know, falling media sales. So it's, it's a, a very interesting dynamic, and I think without a, a, a well-funded and uh, unbiased and um, investigative media, we don't really have the space to have a conversation. And we haven't actually replaced that space as well with any, anything else. So are, are we having local, lots of local meetings? Are we actually engaging people in the political process? We're not actively doing that. You know, there's, there's, there's no way of actively participating in the political process that doesn't either take a lot of time. So there is a, I think there are a lot of deficiencies in the way we, ha we operate a democracy and uh, we need to start engaging people directly, get back to the grassroots, you know, don't want to use grassroots, but get back to people and start having conversations one on, you know, in groups, you know, citizen, you know, have citizen juries. Do we need, you know, well, let's start, really thinking about clever, innovative ways of communicating. And the internet allows you to, um, to yes. do that. You know, IT allows you to have um, these co very interesting conversations and tools to communicate en, en masse. And I don't think we've really explored that space very the, well. The clock is ticking with Sorry. climate change yes. too, isn't it? I mean, it's getting more and more serious every day. 
One of the things that's interested me is how the, there was a report a couple of months ago uh, where they said that the polar ice caps had reached, I think they said that, that, that they weren't going to go backwards now, this yeah. was it, um, in terms of melting. And, and the, the first comment that came after that report was somebody from a climate change organisation saying, well, the good news is that we can still do something about this. Yeah. And I thought, well, you're letting people off the hook. You know, is there a, isn't there a need to start to get aggressive or even slightly hysterical about the language? You know, are we going to let this thing, are we going to be polite about this up to the point that it doesn't, it's too late? That there's, a prob there's a problem, in, and George Monbiot talks about this, is that, uh, you know, you can scare people, but that doesn't actually get them to, to act. So, uh, like in sustainability circles, a lot of people talk about the 2080 rule. So 20% of your conversation is, oh my God, we're in trouble, we're all doomed. And the 80% of the conversation then is, actually, no, we're not. This is how we're going to fix it. Yep. You know? So we always have to talk about solutions. And this is really uh, part of the conversation that we as a Green Party are having with, trying to have with New Zealand, is that with our billboards, you know, we have to say, look, there's these problems, there are these issues. We have solutions for these problems, and we want to kind of have this conversation with the New Zealand public about uh, what those solutions are and how they're very, very positive. They will create jobs. They will enhance our lives. Uh, they will make our. They will make every aspect of our lives better. The solutions to these problems are not scary. They're a chance, an opportunity for us to innovate, for us to advance our civilization, for us to gain empathy and to enhance our environment, enhance our society and enhance our economy at the same time, which is really what sustainability is all about. You, there is this false dichotomy about that you have to, in order to advance your economy, to make it better, you have to destroy your environment. Well, quite frankly, you cannot have an economy without an environment. And an economy, the economy is something we made up. You know, we invented economies in order to, as a means to distribute stuff around. You know, we made it up. The environment isn't made up. That's we're part of it. And I think a lot of what uh, people kind of struggle with is this idea that we're somehow separate from nature, that we're not part of the natural world. And this has come out. Of, I think this came out of the Enlightenment and out of the, uh, the Renaissance, you know, Renaissance period, this idea that somehow we're separate from nature. And you saw it very strongly in the, in the 18th and 19th centuries, so all those landscape paintings. You know, there's beautiful landscapes paintings that come out of America. And there's beautiful landscapes, but there's no people in there. Because nature is out there, it happens yep. out there. And then we reinforce it in the 60s and 70s when we created the national parks, that somehow it's OK to kind of you know, we're here in these cities and towns and stuff and in our farms, but nature's out there in the national parks and these are little walls around it. And once we have these national parks, we're okay. You know, nature's preserved. Well, we're part of nature and nature is all around us. And we have to understand that without nature, without, that we're part of it and we're intimately interconnected with each other. You can't de departmentalize it. You can't depart, there is no departmentalization. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we have to re understand. And this, the, we need, and that's a, that's a paradigm shift in the way people need to think about okay. it. And we're trying to get that, you know, get the message across, you know, and gently. You know, but you unite people by problem solving. People are united by problem solving. Uh, you know, in war situations, like, you know, thinking about World War II in, in London, when the church got the people united because everyone had this, this common, common goal. goal, a hope, you know, and everyone was equal. So as, as um, Orwell said, you know, the, the, the threat to our morale isn't the German bombers bombing us from on high. It's seen uh, Lord and Lady Gaga driving around in the Rolls Royce while everyone else is starving or having to go on rations. Everyone has to be in it together. And as you build yeah, good with quotes. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, he said a lot of clever things. I mean, I don't particularly admire him. Uh, he was a good war leader, but he was a very... As an, <laughs> Anyway, I won't say I, much more I about it. I've got a little yeah. voice in my ear saying that this is participatory and we should have some more Twitter questions. Yes, so okay. let's go to uh, Sam. We've received a question via email from Greg. What will you do for Dunedin businesses? Great question. Okay, so we have... Um, so one of the things that we've announced is uh, a $1 billion 
uh, uh, R&D investment over, ten, over the next three years if we get, when we get in government. So we'll invest $1 billion uh, in research and development and these will be contestable funds uh, looking at sustainable solutions. So if you come up with a good sustainable solution, we'll get on board with you and, and, uh, and uh, get some money in there and come up with these amazing solutions. Also our carbon tax, we're, gonna, we're the only party at the moment uh, actually ha advocating for a tax cut. So, our carbon tax is going to put a price on carbon, which is something that's bad. And we're going to give that, hand that money straight back to the New Zealand public by giving everyone a, a $2,000 tax-free allowance and also giving a, a tax cut to businesses, a 1% tax cut to businesses. And so that will help uh, business and it will help everyone in, the, in, in our communities. And so we're going to directly invest in, uh, in, our, in our economy. So, Dunedin is going to uh, benefit from that because we have a lot of creative, amazing, intelligent people here. We have creative people here, we have artists, we have amazing academics, we have the resources of the Polytech and the university, we have amazingly creative IT uh, sector, we have a great engineering sector which is, you know, which is kind of a hidden secret. We have a fantastic location. If we want to become a, a city of the 21st century, we have the solutions for that. We make the city a really attractive place for people to come to. And if we put in good in IT infrastructure, uh, that will mean that light industries or weightless industries that are based around design and innovation can come and base themselves here. People can have an amazing lifestyle and bring good quality, high paying jobs into our economy. That's really, really what we need. Look, as an Aucklander, let's move to Dunedin. I couldn't agree with you more. I think this is a magnificent city. It really has so much potential. Uh, I've got one more question yes. before we end. Uh, on come uh, the day after the election, uh, it looks like we might have more kingmakers than we've got kings. Uh, at the moment, they don't seem to be looking as if they can talk to each other. Do you think we're going to have an unholy mess on our hands after the election? Oh, it. I don't know, to be honest, and I've seen kind of the, 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 the backroom figures, this election is going to be incredibly tight. Every single vote counts. So if anyone thinks that their vote doesn't count, it does. Every single vote will count. It's really interesting what's happening with uh, the Conservative Party and um, New Zealand First and uh, ACT. Um, I don't know exactly what's going to happen in that sphere because it's a really interesting kind of, you know, uh, group of uh, voters there that they're trying to attract. Um, and I really, I, to anyone to make a prediction, except that it's going to be very close on election day, is, is going to be, they'd be mad. They'd be mad to make any kind of prediction at all. It's going to be really close. Everyone should get a vote. It's really, really important. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shane, Thank for you. joining us at such short notice. It's been wonderful talking to you. Uh, and... Uh, Thank you to, to our uh, researchers. Uh, I neglected to mention last week's re researchers who are Lissandro and Francis and Hannah. Very much appreciate the, all the effort people put into uh, providing us with good questions. And uh, also this week's uh, researchers who were H Hannah again and Paul. So thanks for that. Next week on Vote Chat, we're going to be talking to Helen Kelly. Dell's coming along to interview Helen Kelly from the New Zealand Council of Trade Unions. Uh, so that promises to be really interesting. So I hope you'll join us. Until then, uh, see you next week.